Hey, how's it going? You are here for Heavy Art Talk. Today, I have Kalen joining me. He's worked with a ton of bands, including Last 10 Seconds of Life, Acacia Strain, Humanity's Last Breath, uh, Lorna Shore, looking at my notes, because it's quite a bit, uh, Surreption as well. But yeah, I've really liked Kalen's work for quite some time. I like how painterly uh, he approaches a lot of his album covers. And it's been really cool to see him do like some like sigils and like logo work as well. Um, so quite a bit of diversity in terms of skill. But without further ado, I'm going to welcome him in. What's up, dude? Hey, how's it going, Lee? It's going good, man. Appreciate you joining me. You just got back from Egypt and... We're talking a little bit backstage, but I was curious, like, what's something you've been listening to recently? Uh, I've been listening to a lot of, um, well, because I went to Egypt, I've been listening to Nile a lot. <laughs> okay. Really yeah. Was, it's fitting. The whole, yeah, thing. Uh, it was also like one of the, it's like two of their albums, the only two that I remember to download on Spotify. So, and not a repeat of Nile. But um, yeah, uh, getting back, I've been, uh, you know, trying to catch up on some new music. Um, there's this one band I uh, just listened to. It's like a doom metal band called, or totally butchered. It's like Ufamamat, something like oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know. I, I'm not that familiar with their music, but I definitely have seen the covers and heard the name before. Um, I don't think, they're, are they an American band or are they European? Yeah, but no. I, I'm not sure. It, to be honest, they sound European. But, um, but yeah, I mean, so like that's kind of getting me into uh, – back into doom metal a lot so just stuff like that yeah very cool what nile albums were you spinning mm. i'm terrible with names but um <laughs> they're long too i imagine you know yeah they're all like like that um actually i work with uh i worked with brian i think it's brian their their guitarist before he's like a side project called imperishable okay so he's, he's a nice dude but uh bio melodic Rights was one. That one's okay. one of my favorite albums by them. And then they're one of the recent ones. Uh, what should be? What should not be on Earth? So a lot of the recent albums, but um, huh. yeah. And then those whom the gods test. That's always that's always a good one. Yeah, I always just frequent. I'm looking at it as well because I want to make sure I get the names right. But uh, amongst the catacombs and annihilation of the wicked, those are the ones. You know. Yeah. I mean, I remember like in high school. Um, I don't know. We're probably fairly similar age. Uh, I'm 32, but like there was like this, um, you know, you'd have to literally go on like cable TV and then there were these channels way far out, like in like the 700s or something. It was like the music choice. And I remember seeing um, Behemoth Slaves Shall, Slaves Shall Serve for the first time. And just that scared the shit out of me. And I loved it. <laughs> and then uh, Lashed by the Slave Stick um, by Nile. I think, I don't know, I guess two things on Slaves, but uh, they were both very intense songs. So I remember those tracks pretty vividly. Yeah, I, I got into heavier music because uh, my local library um, stocked like a bunch of like deathcore and metalcore like CDs. So like Suicide Silence and The Acacia Strain and, you know, like, my, my Child, My Bride, like, you know, just stuff like that. So um, So I picked them up and you know, download them on my, my iPod. So yeah. that was kind of, that was my introduction to a lot of, actually a lot of the bands that I work with nowadays too. So. Yeah, man. I was, uh, I mean, you know, I'm kind of the same boat too. Like a lot of my, my friends that are older in the, the metal scene and stuff, they, they have a ton of, I want to call it pride. It's just, it's part of their upbringing, but like they were around, you know, when like death metal was first coming out in like the early nineties, but like, for me, that stuff was already established. And the thing that was new uh, was Deathcore, you know? So, like, I, that was part of my high school as well. You know, I still remember, like, when Job for a Cowboy came out with the Doom EP and then there were the SpongeBob, uh, you know, videos and stuff. And, like, that went crazy viral on MySpace. And, like, that, that was the thing, you know? And looking back, it was kind of a special time, at least, you know, through rose-colored glasses, you know? Yeah, yeah, I definitely think like especially with deathcore stuff, it was uh, it was like a genre that was kind of pushing the boundaries of like what had already been established. So it's 
I mean, personally, I prefer like older deathcore just because it, it felt more raw. You know, it was like totally. a more raw sort of aesthetic. Or nowadays, I feel like you know it's a lot more kind of polished and a lot of bands kind of you know cannibalizing the genre. You know, other bands. But uh, but yeah, I mean, like personally, now nowadays I listen to a lot of like actually older stuff because uh, you know I I didn't I didn't really get into much of that until uh, until I was older. So it was kind of backwards for me. It was you know. Death metal is the stuff that I listen to. Older death metal is the stuff I listen to now. You know, when I was growing up, it was like you know the newer stuff that was coming out. So, yeah, hundred yeah. percent, man. But you know, it, it is interesting that uh, you know, just like how big deathcore and like brutal death metal and, and stuff that's on like Unique Leader is, and, and like other. Um, I mean, Century Media has like some deathcore bands too, but like. For a lot of death metal fans, it's like an ugly word. But then you look at like the ticket sales, you look at the Spotify numbers, and the stuff is so much bigger, you know. And that doesn't mean that it has more or less artistic merit per se. It's just like I don't. I I'm not in denial that the stuff is pretty damn popular and huge. You know, and I I think it's interesting. But I don't listen to deathcore all the time. But uh, I I'm definitely not somebody who turns my nose up to it either. You know what I mean? Yeah, I feel like, I mean, it's definitely a lot more, you know, accessible genre for people who, you know, don't really listen to stuff. I mean, personally, I, I don't really listen to Deathcore really much uh, either. Um, a lot of the stuff I'm going to do is like, you know, Black Metal and Death Metal, and, you know, Doom and things that I feel like are a lot of the bands, you know, it's it's less commercialized, you know, in a sense. So, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, a lot of my start also in art was, you know, working with Deathcore bands. So I kind of have to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean but i imagine a lot of the deathcore bands you know they don't really listen to a lot of deathcore either you know because i've seen enough interviews they're they're pulling from stuff outside of it i mean i feel like for the latest generation i feel like uh travis ryan and cow decapitation has been like one of the bigger like crossover influences that i've heard i feel like there's a lot more uh drawing from that than there ever was in the past yeah, it's funny because he hates deathcore. It's uh, yeah, yeah. Because I've I've worked with him for um, the catalytic adaptation sigils and, and stuff and some verse designs. He's always like, I, I had like the funniest interaction with him where he was like, I think I I asked him about what the upcoming album cover was going to be the terrorist night. Yeah, because like he the sigil had like some sort of bug appendage in it. So I was like, is it going to be you stepping on bugs or something? And he's like, the only bugs I'm going to be stepping on are deathcore fans or whatever <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <Right cool. laughs> he's a cool dude though yeah you know? yeah i've heard good things man he's really intelligent guy i like what anytime i see an interview of him i'm always really intrigued yeah but like uh for you growing up and stuff do you have like any memories of like the first um visual art that like caught your attention it doesn't have to be like fine art i mean it could be uh illustrations used for even like video game art or stuff like that but do you recall like any kind of moments that sparked you yeah so for me um dan mumford was a big oh yeah like, sort of intro to the uh sort of world of music graphics and, and art um you know i when i was younger i, I most of us to like pop punk and you know yeah so yeah data rem remembers cover and yeah, yeah. So like stuff like a day to remember, or like you know, Black Dolly murder was like yeah, the werewolf tea that sold yeah. like two hundred <laughs> shirts probably. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. That iconic werewolf tea. Oh yeah, man. I think I had a, a picture or whatever that I printed off of like some school printer and had like my like recording space. But but yeah, so a lot of that, you know, the very intricate sort of line work and colors and all that was like for me it was you know something I hadn't really. Focused on because like a lot of like you know punk rock and you know uh, pop punk and all that stuff. Just covers are you know very simple. It's like you know just photos or like yeah. graffiti or whatever. So so seeing these very intricate sort of worlds that were created in metal art was like a big like you know wow you know this is I connect with that you know so hundred percent man. I mean that was I mean D Dan's still doing a lot of really cool work and he's works a lot of like movie companies and stuff like that now. Um, but that was such like a, a look of the time as well. Like you're bringing back all this nostalgia for me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, he's uh he's doing really well for himself. The work he does. Yeah. Um what about like you know, kind of your art journey at the beginning then? Did you, you know, start just doing a lot of drawings on paper or did you go to digital fairly early? Um so I made the mistake of uh getting into photo book as a kid um as my, you know, intro to the art world. Um which kind of taught me a lot of bad habits, not gonna lie, but uh, but it was uh, you know, Photoshop. I mean, I could, I could, I'd been able to draw before that, but not like very well. So, so doing like photo manipulation covers was kind of like an easy jump into being able to do the really crazy covers that I saw, you know, established artists doing. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, that's kind of where I started. I did photo manipulation, then it slowly evolved over time to me being more like the way that I want to express myself and the way that I want to have my works look like I need to have the skills of like, you know, painting and drawing and, and all that. So, so that kind of came a little bit later on, but, but yeah, it was mostly, mostly digital was, was where I got my start. Interesting. What, what are some of the traps that, you know, if you were able to tell the younger self to try to avoid, like, what are some of those that you experienced? Did it just kind of stunt your growth in general or how do you feel about it? Um, I mean, I definitely would tell my younger self to learn how to draw. Better. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, that's still something I struggle with a bit now is, uh, you know, relearning a lot of my the fundamentals of drawing. Um, just because, like, I never really established that background. Um, like, I, you know, I can do rendering and painting, you know, really well, but like getting those first, like, sort of drawing, you know, technical drawings down is, you know, I mean, it's still, it's like, I'm able to do it, but it's, it's still, you know, a little bit of a struggle. So oh, that's, that's something I wish I had started earlier, but. I can relate to that. I, yeah. I've <laughs> spent this morning struggling a bit, so it's fresh in my mind. Yeah. Now you, you've caught me on a interesting day of uh, imposter syndrome, which isn't that common for me. That's not usually my, my common trap, but today I, today I'm feeling very much like a, uh, like a hack, you know? Yeah. So I just got to push through that because I've been here before, you know, that's part of putting in the years of being an artist is you'll return to the traps, maybe not as frequently, but yeah, man, I, I'm not feeling too good on my art today, but that's fine because today's just one day, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, you know, <laughs> oh, it's fine. so, you know, I definitely don't think you're an imposter to any other artist. So. I appreciate it. But, but yeah, man, I mean, I'm still looking up photo reference all the time and taking my own for like hands and feet and, and, and you know, it, I don't, I don't see an end in sight. I think they're just really helpful. Even if I have gotten better at those things, the, I still seem to be uh, using photo reference quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's actually really important to have photo reference. I mean, like, especially if you're doing very technical work, I mean, cause like, Personally, I, I don't know how, the, how like, you know, so, like the hand's supposed to look in certain positions, you know, because like, I think it is, it's like, you know, it's 50% technical knowledge for practice and then 50%, you know, looking and seeing things and sort of seeing how they look. Um, I mean, personally for my work, I know for, you know, some artists where a lot of it's less like technical, it's more just sort of creative output, you know, they, mm -hmm. you, know you don't really need to use a reference, but, but I don't really think code reference is cheating or anything, you know, I mean. A lot of the great artists of the past used models, and, and I mean, like um, even Rembrandt um, used tracings. You know, created his own like projection. And Ike did apparently as well, man. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, but like you know, I'm sure he was able to draw, but it was just it was is trying to get as close to real life as possible. You know. So. Yeah. No, it's funny too because like I. Uh, Sometimes it's just expectations you have on yourself, you know, because I don't expect other people to not use reference. But then for myself today, I'm just beating myself up for it for no reason. And that's not a normal thing. I, I, I'm everything you just said, I would mirror to other artists as well. I'd be like 100% the same thing. But just one of those days that, uh, yeah, it's not a pity party. I just, you know uh -huh. how it is, man. You know, there's, there's the yeah. good days and there's the bad days. I think it's important too in like a, public setting too um for any like beginner artists watching like no matter how good you get you're still gonna have your bad days yeah exactly yeah well back back to you then um 
when when uh do you think was like your first break into working with bands do you recall that um so my like first commission uh was actually some local like punk band uh where i was drawing something in study hall my one of my friends uh who i think was in the band saw it and he was like hey you know we'd love to use that for like a cover and i was like okay cool like didn't you know didn't ask for a commission or you know or like you know uh, to pay for it or anything it was just here you go so but uh but then after that it was like i started joining these like facebook groups um and you know just posting like photo bash covers that i would do or like logos or whatever and uh and then just having you know people would just hit me up and i'll be like okay you know I'll, I'll do a cover for like 50 bucks you know or something really cheap um and that's that was kind of my break into it in the industry was was Facebook groups, and then it just kind of grew from there and there. And then, you know, here I am almost 10 years later still doing it. So, <laughs> but, yeah. When, when was that period where you started shifting uh, and getting more interested in like kind of like classical painting and like the influence that you draw from a lot now? When did you get that interest? Um, I mean, I, th I think I was always sort of interested in that painting style. Um, the progression of my work was it was like kind of like a slow push towards it. So, you know, I started doing photo regulation, then I started doing like matte painting. So I did like, you know, how they do it in video game design where they, you know, will paint, but then they'll use photo textures to kind of like, you know, hurry up the process or give it, you know, a realistic look. And then from there, you know, I slowly started letting go of all those like, you know, using photos and, and fully embracing like painting and traditional processes. Um, so I'd actually say within the last like five years, you know, was when I started fully sort of embracing um, classical art. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I've always been interested in like you know, it's kind of the like sort of mysterious thing for me that like how the hell do they you know they do that? You know, obviously now I understand it, but that was sort of the the catalyst that was like you know I, I want to know how to do this type thing. No, I, that's a really good point. Um... I can kind of relate in a certain way too. that, like growing up, I didn't have like a ton of appreciation for like classical art, but then once you start realizing how difficult this stuff is, it just gets more and more intriguing, you know? Yeah. Um, I saw you post on your story the other day on something that I thought was really interesting. You, you had like a, I was, a, it was just a rough thing, but it was like pricing breakdown of like, all right, you know, you give me a little bit of a vision and a lot of creative freedom. This is your price. This is your price. If you want a bunch of edits, this is the price. If like, you're going to stand right over me and like, tell me exactly what to do. I, know, I was just kind of curious, like you could kind of expand on that. You don't have to mention like bands or people you've worked with that are bad experiences, but like, what, what is that? How does that resonate with you? Yeah, actually I think, uh, cool X design or whatever. He's one, I think he's the one who posted. I reshare that then, but, but yeah, I just I found it kind of funny because I was dealing with a client who was being like very particular um, at the time, and thankfully in the past couple of years that I've been doing this, I've uh, had a lot less of that. So I have a lot less bands kind of being very particular about you know what they want, and they kind of just let me do my own thing. I've also sort of curated my um, client base, but but it is definitely like that. I mean, like you know if you're if you're gonna be really particular if you're going to hire somebody to do anything, then you're going to sit there. Like, you know, if you hire an architect or somebody to renovate your bathroom, you know, you're not going to stand there and tell them how to like use his tools, you know? Yeah. Um, Cause like they, they're, you know, specializing in that. So it's just, it's kind of funny when you get like people who think that they know better than you when you're a professional in this field. And then they're going to tell you, you know, how to do your, your job basically. So for me, it's like, it's more of an annoyance. Like, you know, if you're going to really do that, then I'm just going to charge you more money because you're making the experience, you know, more worse for me. And like the more time, yeah, it's more time. I got to spend doing all your like edits and, and like, to be honest, it, it comes out worse in the end. Cause like you, it's instead of your artistic vision that I'm ex executing for you with, you know, whatever your idea is or my idea, it's your idea. So it's, you know, it's kind of like with AI software where you're, typing in some thing and it shits out, you know, a, a graphic. It, it's like that, you know, you're kind of treating me like, like an AI generative software. 
So I just thought the graphic was funny because it was like, you know, yeah, I'll charge you more money, but it's one, your work is going to become worse. I'm going to make more money and like, you know, it's just going to be a bad experience all around. Yeah. Um, granted saying that, you know, obviously small edits and like adjustments and stuff like, you know, for, for anyone, any potential clients who are listening or thinking this guy's a total, to stick up his ass. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm just talking about like, you know, clients who prove like a sketch or something and then halfway through the process we're like you know i want you to change the entire thing or you know or very a very particular idea in mind you know? yeah there's there's a very tactful way to like give feedback and provide your input and, and like i i'm totally with you there i uh it's probably going to be up by this point by interview with morald and he said something that's really sticking with me he's he said uh he's like I don't work for bands. I work with bands. And like, that's such a simple sentence, but like, I think it speaks a lot of truth because you do want it to feel like a partnership and there's respect for the music and their brand and all that stuff. But there has to be that respect and trust on the other end too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I get this is like, you know, working in a service-based industry with someone, you know, so if some people just treat you like, you know, you're kind of a, Photoshop tool, or you're just the paintbrush, you know, that's putting the marks down instead of you know, like an actual person who has their own vision and own way of doing things. And I, especially in the past, like I, I've like the last couple of years since I've been doing this full time, um, I kind of had to reevaluate the way that I approach my work because I started getting really burnt out with the fact that I was feeling like, you know, none of it was my voice. It was just me kind of creating someone else's, you know, ideas or whatever, or, or kind of pandering to different people's, you know, like aesthetics or different, instead of putting my own voice, my own personality in it. Um, yeah. And so, so yeah, so it was like, you know, and for me, it was like being in the point where I was like, you know, I don't want to do this anymore because it's like, it's just, you know, it's not me. It's, I felt like, you know, AI, and then AI generative software came out and I was like, that's literally how people are treating me. It's just like an AI generative you know robot and uh you know, i don't i don't want that thankfully you know after that i, you know, I started putting my foot down and kind of you know making it more um my style you know more or curating a style too and i think it's actually been really helpful a lot of the bands i work with now are very respectful of that you know i'm still obviously executing their ideas and you know they're, they're part of the process but you know it's it's more about you know like we're all said working with the band and I'm working for them. So, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and to curate that style that you wanted to be known for, did you have to do some like personal work as well? So you could be like, Hey, this is what I do now. Like, was it a blend of taking some time to do that? Yeah. I mean, I think the way I did it was I kind of made a list of all the things that I like to paint or all the things that have influenced me over the years. And, I created like a like collage board of all the work that like speaks to me, like, you know, things that I've seen that I'm like, wow, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. And then from that, you know, it was a lot of, I was pulling a lot of like classical paintings, you know, a lot to do with the occult, mythology, um, you know, romantic symbolism, all that type of stuff. So, so I kind of pulled that all together. And I was like, this is what I want to do, you know, dark sort of classical art, medieval, you know, stuff like, you know, I like sci-fi, you know, I like all the, you know, like horror and gore and stuff like, you know, that's not what I like to paint, you know. And right. So, so, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that was kind of, it was just kind of sitting down and sort of reflecting on and who I am and what my voice is and what influences me and what inspires me and then kind of figure out how that's going to affect my style. So. That's a really good point, man. Cause like, I, I, if I look at my art journey, you know, there was a lot of like dabbling, but not having like a, a, a vision of like what exactly I want to be known for. And up until recently, I don't feel like I've had that, but I've kind of gotten a little more laser focused and uh, I can relate to that a lot, you know, but my, you know, pool is going to be a bit different than yours. And that's what's kind of neat, you know, like the sci-fi and psychedelia and surrealism. That's like kind of my thing that i'm really interested in classical painting somewhat but but not as much but it's cool yeah i mean that's totally cool i mean like i also like that style of art it's just you know what i 
what really speaks to me is you know more obviously the classical and uh, but you know and that's kind of what really defines you as as not just an artist but like as a person you know because that's that's what you're expressing through your art um, and even with working with bands where because that was my whole thing with you know having it where you're working for a band is that you know you if your personality and your your style is not in that if it's just whatever the band is trying to get you to do then you know it's not going to be your work you know you're just kind of there to ex their their thing so yeah what about uh so you know you have on your instagram art director at unique leader kind of represent a little bit i try to you know <laughs> cater to the person but like what what does that entail like what how are those responsibilities uh similar and different from your freelance work yeah so so what i do at unique leader um is i'm the art director and then i'm senior product management um and basically i am in charge of now I'm basically in charge of uh, all the sort of graphics and um, product design that goes out from the label. So, so I'll do I do the vinyl layouts. I'll do the merch designs. Um, I'll do the social media graphics. Um, I'll have the whole setup campaign for any sort of like you know digital graphic that's going to be used for that and the physical. So, um, so yeah. So a lot of it. So I'll, sometimes I'll, I'll work with the band on the artwork. But that that'll be just through freelance. But then it will be released through the label, um, or you know I'll be doing the like the whoever the artist the band commissions, and then I'll take that and I'll make the final layouts and I'll, I'll do all that stuff. Um, but yeah, that's that's mostly what I do. Uh, it's pretty similar to what I do design wise for my work. So you know I also freelance. I I do merch designs um, and album layouts. Um, so so my role at Unique Leader is less on the art side more on the design side. It's basically yeah. what it is. Uh, that's that's cool, man. Like and I admire so much that you have like all these different skills, you know? Cause cause so many artists, uh you know, kinda of think about myself like I can draw and, and do hand drawn illustrations, but graph design, typography, fonts, not too good at that yet. So I, I respect that you like have a lot of um marketable skills you know what i mean like you're very diverse in that thank you yeah yeah i mean I, like i actually struggled with that a little bit because in a lot of ways uh it's always this disparity between being a designer and being an artist yeah and um having to market myself as you know what, what what am i am i an artist or am i a designer or am i both you know how, how are people going to recognize my work if like you know it's the design stuff is using a bunch of different things like you know i would do layouts for bands and, and post the work and it'd be like, you know, this is not like it doesn't really show any sort of unique style. Which right. is also something past year I've been trying to change and sort of have a more unique design style that matches my art style. Um but yeah, um I don't I like also feel like it's kind of good to have just a single focus, you know? Like, you know, I Sometimes I wish I could just just do paintings all day instead of having like paintings and then I got to do like an album layout and I got to do a logo and that's really like, so you know it, it kind of becomes a lot sometimes but um but yeah I mean it's it helped me get this job in new leader and you know it pays the bills I guess so yeah but, no no hundred percent man I guess the grass is always greener huh but yeah I guess <laughs> I guess if I had the choice I'd rather have the skills to be ignorant like me but you know that's fine. <laughs> So what do you think maybe are some like key moments of progression then uh, let's just talk maybe painting wise uh, that like, like some like epiphanies. So once you decided that you wanted to draw from that influence, you know, are there any like lessons from the fundamentals or from the masters that you learned that kind of like had a light bulb moment? Um. Or it could just be a, just a steady slog. It could be either. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's probably a blend of the both. Yeah, it is a, bl a bit of a blend. Because <laughs> um, like with painting and, and drawing and stuff, there's so much to learn, you know? Yeah. Um, and there's so many things to learn. I mean, I think the biggest epiphany I had was I, I did this like uh, sort of drawing um, exercise program thing that's uh called draw a line 
So it's basically where it teaches you how to draw. Uh, the, the whole thing is basically like a crucible of like you draw 200 boxes, whatever. And you have to get the boxes to be like perfectly in perspective. And mm -hmm. basically what it teaches you is, is one, how to sort of slow down and draw like a good line, how to draw, you know, nice lines and also how to understand how perspective works and shape design, you know, shapes work in 3D space or works, <laughs> shapes work in 2D space in a 3D, you know, form. Right. Um, and then, and before and after doing that, just, I saw the incredible progression my work had. I was able to understand sort of how things were positioned in space, you know, how to make things on the flat, you know, how to draw lines properly, how to draw better, more precise. So, so I think that was a big sort of turning point. It was literally just drawing lines and drawing boxes. I mean, um, it's huge though, dude, that's a great exercise because everything fits in a box. Once you realize that everything can fit in a box, you just like Kim Jong G. He doesn't draw the box, obviously, but before he lays down his pen, he's always thinking in terms of the boxes and perspective if he wants to warp them and, you know, rest in peace, obviously. But like, yeah. dude, that's such an important lesson. Yeah. 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 It, was, it was kind of incredible to be like looking at my work before and looking after and then being like, wow, this really sort of changed a lot of things for me. So, so that was one. Um, and then, I mean, also just learning how the old masters sort of, process uh works i mean my process follows very closely to carvaggio um so where he does like you know the underpainting you know staining the canvas underpainting and then you know like working like that um so that kind of really helped define a process for me because before that it was always such a struggle to figure out how to start my paintings um you know i was like do i start working on this like you know it would always get really messy because I wouldn't have a very good technical drawing. Um, and then after that, it was a lot easier to deal with very, very sort of add more realism to my work and be more precise with my brush strokes and all that. So, so yeah, so learning from the old masters was, was a big turning point as well. That's really cool. So you use the old masters techniques, but you now have the benefit of like layers and digital technology too. So it's, that's really cool approach. So you even kind of like stain the canvas, like kind of that brown, you know, kind of wash like a lot of them did? Yeah, I think you had a graphic um, for my The Last 10 Seconds of Life, which kind of shows a little bit of how I start. But, um, but yeah, you you see the uh, background is kind of like, a yeah, so you see the background is kind of a brownish color. Mm -hmm. So so that will be the stain, and I'll use some sort of like textured brush. Um, and then I will paint in, the uh, shadows. So if you see like the dark brown areas, it's, it's the shadows and that's the underpainting. And then the, then I painted the light tones. So you're basically separating, you know, the form and kind of plotting out how the, you know, composition is going to go before putting down any details. Um, and it's a, one, it creates a very painterly look because you'll still have the underpainting show through just like as if it was a traditional painting into the final painting. Um, and then, and then you see on the the, uh, the right where that's the final final version, but you can still see where those values and um, are and I'm all mapped out. Yeah, all mapped out. Yeah. So Once you me, have that part on the left, I imagine a lot of the. Uh, for me, I can relate to like, okay, I, I I have a plan. Now here's the fun part of like just finishing it out. You know what I mean? There's yeah. still problems to be solved, but like at that point, there's probably a little bit of a sigh of relief, right? Yeah, I mean, because personally, I'm a very visual person, so under understanding like sort of the abstract of things and the sort of technical aspects of things, you know, while I'm painting is is a little bit difficult. So, kind of getting everything out there in the beginning, like the values, and then just having to go in and just render. Because then after that, I'll just go in, I'll, I'll block out the background. Usually I keep that pretty loose and then I'll go in individually, like sort of grid by grid and I'll just render out, you know, each like mm. um, part. So I'll go in I'm, like the face on one of the demons and I'll just go in and like paint that out. Um, and it just, it makes it a lot easier because I know there's a lot of, there's some artists who can just like block in, you know, like put down some paint and then um, basically just, you know, 
render it out from there. But for me, it's, you know, I, I have to be able to see what I'm, you know, doing. So, I mean, I, I think I'd be the same way in doing it in like watercolor. I would do a similar approach of washes and kind of keeping it really fluid and, and messy at first and then tightening up over time. So I could definitely relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what kind of things do you do outside of work? What are some of your hobbies? Um, so I play a lot of video games. Um, I'm big on uh, Magic the Gathering. Um, I, uh, I read a lot, you know, movies, hang out with friends, um, travel. I mean, traveling always is, uh, helps a lot with inspiration in my work, you know, because I, I try to go to a lot of places that are like very have very rich histories or cultures. Um, so, so yeah, so a lot of that, um, I try not to, like, I'll take weekends off. Like I won't do anything art related on weekends. Um, after I'll work throughout the day. And then as soon as it hits like five, six o'clock, I'm done. Don't think about art. Don't respond to clients, you know, just do my own thing, you know, so I'm not constantly oversaturated with, you know, work and art and all that. Um, yeah, that's, <laughs> did you have to find that work-life balance you you kind of had some years or times of it it not going so well there yeah i mean especially in college in my undergrad um i mean i remember my like sophomore year i didn't really have like that many friends and uh it was uh i, I had like a single storm so i was very like by myself all the time yeah um, so and all i would do was just artwork you know i was just constant painting whatever you know, I think I was currently getting into like the matte painting aspect of things. So it was like learning how to paint, but then still kind of relying on my photo manipulation of digital um, techniques. Um, and that was very, very lonely. I mean, I, I, I had like a lot of like, you know, sort of mental health like issues. Um, and so coming out of that, I really learned to like have, especially making this into a career um have time for words i'm just not doing anything you know absorbing you know coming up with ideas uh but you know not act actively thinking about work and art um and you know also you know trying to be more social and um you know because being an artist you, know, you spend a lot of times time by yourself in the studio you know with unless obviously you have some sort of different setup but but for me personally you know i, I spend a lot of time alone so trying to you know be social with friends and and, and that is very important. Yeah. yeah well, I can relate. And then you kind of, you got to recognize when you're kind of falling down that pit, you know what I mean? Because sometimes, uh, I don't know. I find that I, I don't know what's actually the best thing to do at a particular moment until, you know, I've already kind of gone past it. So I like that you have like these balance points and stuff. And like, also in taking things, books, even video games, whatever, like that can source inspiration as well. So if you're always drawing, you're actually not being a sponge to new inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, as you can probably see, you know, read a lot and have a lot of reference materials that are, that I uh, try to absorb. And, you know, cause I feel like a lot of, at least for me, when I was first starting out, I, uh, I was always just looking at other artists that were in the you know same field as me and kind of yeah. it kind of you know becomes a bit of like an echo chamber you know you're just copying especially metal art because I feel like metal art is very you know uh, cannibalizing itself a lot you know it's all about skulls and death and which is all super cool you know but it's you know trying to find unique ways to sort of say those things instead of just doing every other person's done for you so so I think taking a break and and doing things that are not related to what your art and you know job is is very important for especially for creative people you know so percent i know you're a berserk fan as well we were messaging about it didn't they just release like the 97 like blu-ray set did you, did you buy that or do you have any interest in that Oh, this is the first time I'm hearing about it, so I'm yeah. definitely now. <laughs> I think uh, I think it actually like sold out. I just looked on like Amazon earlier. I don't have a DVD player now, but yeah, they did a Blu-ray, all the episodes set, and it's pretty high demand currently. Oh. Yeah, I um, I found the uh, Golden Age Arc DVD set, which is like 
like super expensive at um, half price books um, for like 15 bucks or something. It's like crazy. Of course, my, nice. my ex ended up taking it. So I was like, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, the Blu ray side would be super cool. I know they have it all for free on YouTube, but. Um, oh, they yeah. do? I didn't know that. Yeah, I think you can find it on YouTube, all the, the episodes. Oh. Yeah, basically. I am midway through the deluxe version. So I'm not reading the traditional one. So I'm all going by those leather bound, you know, the fake yeah. leather sets. I'm, I finished the golden age arc and I'm like halfway through five. But then what happened was, and I know you're interested in this too. I watched Dune part two and I was just so blown away. I was like, I got to read this book. So now I'm reading Dune and I'll maybe come back, but like I'm in a big sci-fi kick right now. And like, I know oh, yeah. people like love Dune. They, they have uh i've heard mixed reactions to the the movie mostly positive but man that movie just blew me away dude right i have the um book club edition uh, oh shit that's like the one of the og covers too isn't yeah, it yeah i actually i have all the um the uh, original ones as well oh the first six yeah right right before the uh the movies came out so they uh, they spiked in price after that but this one by favorite. I got it at the Strand in um, New York, but this is also one of my favorite sci-fi series. So, yeah. Have you read all six? Or um, yeah, I even read some of the uh, his son's like the Brian first. Yeah, when he was like, "This is cool. <laughs> <laughs> not as good." Yeah, I was not a fan of his son stuff, but um, but yeah, no, the Dune, um, especially the movie. I think the movie is probably one of my favorite movies right now. So. Yeah, it's exceptional, man. And yeah. like, yeah, there's some details that are like different in the books, but like, I, I don't know. I, I'm so biased because I saw the movies first, but like, they really were a good representation and a slightly different take on some of the things. But, um, out of the first six, besides the, the first one, what's your, your favorite? Um, I think the, uh, God Emperor of Dune one, yeah. I think that was, I like that one a lot. Honestly, after, uh, that he kind of goes off on a weird tangent. So I still enjoyed it, but um, it, got, it got a little weird in a couple of last books. So. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've heard God Emperor is good. I'm interested in it. It's like very philosophical or something. Yeah. The next one also is, uh, which I think they're making the third part of Dune about, which is... Uh, uh, well, they're going to go Messiah, aren't they, with the, the yeah. movies? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. Um, the book, well, I mean... I don't want to ruin it if you're going to read the book, but but it's it's um it's a really interesting take because the whole his whole idea was that Doom was supposed to, you know um, Paul was supposed to be like an anti-hero, right? You know, so he was supposed to, it was a warning against you know charismatic you know like leaders and and cult like you know personalities and followings, but then everybody sort of like nobody like Saw figured that, that yeah they they all they all were like oh you know Paul's a you know hero, so I actually liked in the movie where they kind of Cheney um, sort of like calling him out all the time. Yeah. You know, for, you know, doing this. But, I thought um, he seemed, I thought he seemed kind of, uh, especially once the attack on, um, you know, Rackin happened, I felt like he, there was a big turn in the book. Whereas the movie, his, his arc and turn of character really was towards the end. But I feel like in the book, it was more, more towards the middle. So I feel yeah. like sometimes the timing of things is a bit different in the storytelling for the book versus the movie. Yeah. Plus, I mean, yeah, the a lot more time to establish it in the book, but, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, Frank Herbert is, uh, he had his own, you know, issues, you know, personal shit, but, um, but like, yeah, definitely very brilliant, brilliant writer. Yeah. I just bought a bunch of sci-fi books too that I have to like chip away at as well. Cause I got, yeah. I got down a whole kick of like, what are the other books that I should read and that stuff? Like, do you have any other sci-fi picks outside of the Dune world? Um, let's see, I read a lot of like last century sci-fi. I'm not really a big fan of anything new century. Like, you know. Current yeah, current. I'm the same. Yeah. So I love, um, H.G. Wells. He's a, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of his work is, I think, quite profound. Very, um, interesting to see a lot of his stuff reflected in today's era. You know, um, but uh, yeah, H.G. Wells. Um, I read all the Ender series. That was also a series that got really weird. 
towards the like later books. But um, I do have plans to revisit Ender's Game. I watched it. I mean, I read it when I was a kid, and I liked it a lot. You know. Yeah, the next the, the books after that are very like sort of trippy. So you you you'll probably like them. Um, the Foundation. I don't know if you've seen the new show. It's on Apple TV. Yeah, uh, that's Asmanov, right? Yeah, yeah, that one is. Uh, that series is really good. Um, yeah, Have you read uh, uh, Hyperion. I just bought that one. I'm pretty excited about it. It sounded kind of cool. Yeah, actually, I think it was recommended to me. I think it's on my list of uh, stuff to read. Because so. I'm interested in this, like, because it's very you know things that are like inspired by Doom, but like the whole religion meets sci-fi and like that kind of like paradox i think is really interesting and like uh I, that's what i love so much about dune is like it's like futuristic but also not futuristic at the same time because you know the they basically could not trust computers and stuff and they had to do the mentat you know type yeah. of training really fascinating but yeah <laughs> we should go on a giant tangent but you know <laughs> this is a good conversation <laughs> All right, well, all right, so back to visual art. Perfect segue. What, what would be your, your visual artist Mount Rushmore? So for the international audience, what would be like four artists that are like your heroes, basically, like kind of the, the, the ones that you look up to? Um, to be honest, most of them are dead. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that's, that's normal. Uh, JMW Turner is a big one. Um, Carvaggio. Uh, let's see. Um, John Martin is a uh, his work gets used a lot for um, like album covers. Um, okay. Yeah, trying to do one. <laughs> Can't remember any right now, but yeah, John Martin is a big. So it's, you know, it's like public domain stuff, so that's why fans can use it. Yeah, it's that old. Yeah, he's like eighteen hundreds uh, British uh, painter. Okay. Um, what was that three? Yeah. So, three more. Um, oh yeah, and then. Um, Slav Dorf, sorry, <laughs> totally blanked on the name, but I get the book behind me. Uh, Gustav Dorf, so for Oh, yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah. What about, I think I saw you in the post for the uh, Fires in the Distance, right? That album cover you did? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, did you, did you, uh, I think you mentioned John Singer Sargent. Do you, do you like oh, his work a lot too? Yeah, yeah, his work is incredible. Um, he his, speaks uh, to me a lot too, man. I, I like that, like, those uh, painters from like kind of the, the early 1900s in particular. Yeah. And that's late 1800s as well. Yeah, he was an incredible painter. He would, uh, his brush efficacy was incredible. He would basically, yeah. like, if he didn't get the, uh, the underpainting correct on the first, like, couple of strokes, he would completely wash it off and start again. And then he would, he would make the models that he was, like, painting sit there for hours while he would do this. Um, but yeah, incredible painter. I, I've seen some of his works in museums, and it's always, like, insane seeing just how, like, well he was able to just do one single brush stroke and realistically define, like, a hand or, like, a sleeve or whatever. So, yeah. So that, the thing is, like, I see some of those, like, nods in your work, too, because you don't hide the brush strokes. Like, your stuff... A lot of it isn't like super tightly rendered when you really look at it, and I, I think that's a cool thing. You know what I mean? Like it's tight where it needs to be, but I can see the strokes, uh, and I really dig that. Thanks. Yeah, I try to. I like. I mean, I like to leave sort of um, like for me when I see a painting, I like to be able to kind of see where the thought process, like sort of what was beneath the uh, the work, yeah, or you know what where the the sort of the human aspect you know comes in. Um, so that's why I like to kind of leave some things loose and, and just cause like also painting, you know, leaving certain things loose is important to make sure that, you know, your focus is the focus and not, you know, everything things going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Is there, when you are painting in the various stages, is there a part that you enjoy the most the part of the process? Um, I really like, I like the ideation process um, and sort of more towards the end of the painting. I like when the painting kind of has come together. You kind of can see the world that you built. And then it's just, you know, then you go in and you start 
adding things and kind of tagging things up here and there. I know a lot of artists don't like that part, you know, because it's like the very technical boring part of just tightening stuff up. But like, like you know, my work is a little looser, so I don't have to worry too much about being super technical. But yeah, but uh, because for me, a lot of what I get out of painting and art and stuff is telling the story, you know, bringing myself and the audience into this world that, you know, doesn't exist in our own world. It's, you know, my opinion, more interesting than the mundane, you know, day-to-day -day life. So, but yeah, so. What about the part that is the most stressful or the most difficult for you? Um, I think actually also the two parts I just said, the ideation <laughs> process and, um, and uh, the, the, also just uh, the setup in the beginning. Um, I think there's a lot of sort of, because like that's, you know, that's going to set up everything that's going to come after in the painting. So there's yeah. a little bit, you know, a lot of pressure to make sure that you get it right. Um, like the composition map, getting like the right reference, thinking about the whole layout, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, or, or just literally just putting down, you know, the, the, the brush stroke, first brush strokes, you know, and because like, I, I'm sure a lot of, you know, painters out of that where you, know, you kind of freeze a little bit because you're like, oh shit, you know, this is going to be permanent or, well, in digital it's a little less so, but at least my process is, you know, it's, I try to make it a little more permanent. So, so yeah, I think the, the, the sort of like initial setup, because like, you know, when you're halfway through a painting, if like, you know, you did, if the initial composition or whatever is like not good you're kind of screwed you know because like you have a timeline you know you have other things to work on you can't really restart because it's already been approved so so yeah there's a lot of pressure for that initial stage makes sense something you just mentioned that i thought was interesting well i wanted to highlight a little more you made it sound like you don't like to hit undo very much with some of your strokes like you like to treat them like they're permanent do you mind elaborating on that yeah, so I mean, my process, like, I work digitally. Um, I I can work traditionally. I just, there's a lot, a big learning curve for me for getting back into traditional uh, that I personally just don't have the time for right now. Plus, digital is just a lot easier for sending drugs to clients and, you know, um, do, you know, changing anything if there needs to be some sort of major change. But, uh, but I try to keep it as painterly as possible. You know, I want to make it look like it's a oil painting that did, you know, traditionally mm -hmm. so so a big part of that is is leaving the mistakes and you know leaving the brush strokes that you know maybe i didn't mean to do that or maybe it's like covering something and then i have to go in and kind of you know carve it back out um but yeah but i, I try to you know because like also for that there's you know that has a human sort of aspect to it where you know if you're constantly undoing things and you, you get a very like digital look to to your work which is a style in itself it's just you know not, not what you're going work. for yeah, exactly. That's really cool, man. And that makes a lot of sense too, seeing your stuff. Thanks. Kind of kind of talking about that a little bit. Um this is a very general kind of uh just talking point. So I'm not writing anything in stone here, but like let's say you have painting A in front of you and you have painting B, and your mind quickly makes a judgment that Painting A is maybe a little bit amateurish or like okay, and then painting B is excellent. What are some components that you would see in painting A that maybe wouldn't be fully developed in a lot of cases? You know, some it's kind of a generalized statement, but you kind of catch my drift. Like what separates yeah. good from great art in a lot of cases? Um, I think it's the sort of intent the artist has behind it and then the technical ability to back that up. So like if you're trying to paint realistically and you're like the eye is like here, and like the nose is like crooked and like, you know, or whatever, or like the rendering is completely flat, but your your intent was to make this look like a realistic portrait, then in my opinion that's not, you know, like a good piece of work because you haven't put in the energy or the or, you know the time to to develop the skills. Um, whereas, you know, cause like, you know, there's different levels of like artistic expression, you know, some artists sort of have a more less realistic look to their work or that's more like, you know, like there's this one artist I really like, his name is uh, David Glomba. I think. Yeah. I, yeah. 
is work. You know, it's not like very like hyper realistic. You know, the um, but you can see that it, he knows he could paint hyper realistic if he wanted. You know, he's just chosen to sort of express himself in a different way. You know, more, more expressive. stylized. Yeah, yeah. I, I like his work a lot too. Yeah, and in that case, you know, you look at it and I'm like, that's that's a good painting. You know, whereas if I saw someone who's like not you know like it's it's stylized or whatever but the intent was not to be stylized the intent was to be more realistic or whatever then i'm like no it's not good or if it just you know it just looks like you didn't put that much time in it or you just you know have really like also for me a big thing is is growth you know i think you know as an artist it's very important to constantly work to grow you know learn new skills you know not stagnate you know try new things so, and there's a lot of artists that I see that kind of stagnate, you know, they, they, um, they, it becomes, it's too hard, you know, to, or it's uncomfortable to learn these things. So they kind of just say, all right, this is my style, you know, yeah. and I'm gonna make, you know, that's going to be my thing. And, and then, you know, they kind of just do that forever. And to me, that's, you know, that you kind of stunting your own journey. Um, but, uh, I mean, to each their own, you know, like art is art, like, you know, people express themselves different ways. Um, and, you know, I try not to be too judgmental. I mean, you know, if you're going to, you're going to take a banana to a wall, whatever, man, like, you know, that's your, that's your thing. It's, I guess. Yeah. Right I mean, here. I bring, I bring this up because I think I find when people have, uh, you know, you're obviously polite and you have tact, but I like to hear people's opinions because you have to have conviction in art too. You know, you kind of have to, and like, you don't have to be a jerk about it. That's why we're not naming any names. I don't think there's any need to, but like knowing what you like and why something is good and why something isn't good, I think it's an important part of developing your taste, you know? So I, I, I don't shy away from it as long as it's come from a place of respect and also helping people if, if you have the opportunity. You know? Exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, I think it's, you know, very important to uh, foster like a, a sense of, you know, growth and, and um, you know, mutual respect with artists. But, you know, I feel like, you know, if someone doesn't want to grow, you know, they're not going to, you know, but, but yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, like good versus bad art, I, I definitely, or good versus not as good art, um, definitely think energy, you know, the amount of energy that's been put in, the amount of, you know, thought, the, uh, the, the know-how behind it, you know, those are all things that I think very much define what, what makes something good or not. Yeah. Makes, makes a lot of sense. One last thing before we get to the, the work and I'm sure it'll illuminate some other things, but, um, what's something that for your art you want to push yourself with in the next year like uh it could be technical it could be trying to get a different type of client outside of metal it could be a little bit of everything but like is there anything you've just been thinking about that you want to improve at um so i've been going back and uh relearning like really going getting in depth on human anatomy um yeah. I, I rely a lot on sort of reference as well um which is fine but i want to be able to kind of like be able to change things a little, you know, and kind of and still have that same level, of, you know, uh, realism, which, you know, unless you know exactly how the bones are and the you know, muscles and everything underneath, you know, it's very hard to be able to be like, okay, you know, this, and this angle is going to look like this, and, you know, and all that. Um, so yeah, so for me, it's a lot of, I'm trying to get back and learning a lot more technical things, um, getting better at, you know, at drawing, um, I recently started really getting into um, illustrative like work, so a lot of like uh, you know doing cross hatching. And, and, oh yeah, uh, yeah, we'll highlight some of that stuff for sure. Yeah, so I mean that's always something I've been very interested in, but painting has sort of been like more of what I focused on. Uh, but I've been recently really getting into doing like illustrative work. Um, I actually had some had some pretty exciting clients that I got to do for too, um, that will be hopefully released at some point. Um, <laughs> the curse right yeah right <laughs> yeah um but yeah so so that's that's the two big things um clients i i kind of have stopped really i mean i i recently just got a huge bucket list client um that i've always wanted to work with like like also 
uh, one of the biggest sort of icons of the genre. But um, so for me, it was like, holy shit, that's awesome. Um, type of thing. But in terms of like bands I want to work with, you know, I'm, even if you're like the smallest band ever, as long as you, you know, you respect me, my work, and like, you know, you're someone cool to work with, you know, I don't care with you, you know? And, and obviously, my, my, my prices. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, mostly just personal development, personal skill development. So. Yeah, those are good points. Yeah, <clears throat> working on anatomy, man, it's like a never ending journey. Do yeah. you have any uh, uh, books that you like for anatomy to, to work from? Like, do you like Bridgman or Loomis or any of that kind of stuff? Uh, I actually, I, um, I've been using, I've been learning from Proco. Um, Proco is great. Yeah, Proco is, uh, he has great resources. Um, so I've been, I've been doing his courses, uh, which kind of combine, you know, Loomis and all the other, uh, like, origins of sort of, how the human body works breaking it down. Um, I also got this great book by um, Michael Hampton about figure drawing, sort of design and all that. Okay, uh, I don't have that one. Yeah, he's a he's a he breaks it down nicely because it's not just about like sort of the technical aspect of things. He uh, mm. sort of shows the flow of the body and how to make it look, you know, because like you know the problem with like anatomy is that it becomes very stiff. So yeah. You know, yeah. You know, you know what book, uh, if you feel inclined to check out, it, it's a classic, um, but if you want really fluid figures that have some level of realism, but, you know, are stylized, uh, How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way is a classic, man. It's got, you know, John Buscema. Um, it's all his instruction and teaching and stuff, but it's like a $20 book. But if you, like, combine that with, like, the more like technical, like anatomically accurate and understanding all of the bones and the muscles and stuff, you kind of fuse them together. You could get a good sense of motion. So I don't know. Okay. No, it's something that I, I like that book a lot. And it's got a lot more than just comic book applications. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think comics are a great place because like just there, there's so much gesture that you have to like same thing with animation, you know? Yeah. Um, I know Broco goes a lot about talks a lot about like Disney animation. Um, to kind of reinforce uh, gesture, just because like you think it, it would be easy to be able to draw, you know, like Mickey Mouse or something, but actually there's you know a lot of sort of you have a lot of technical knowledge to be able to break down the form into sort of these basic shapes and still make them look, you know, there's so much flow in those figures, yeah. man. That and like um, there's a guy uh, on Instagram, um, you know, he was like an animator for like Looney Tunes, uh, Jim Roper. He does okay. like breakdowns of like just like some like characters and stuff. And man, it's like the the rhythm lines and like the gesture like you're talking about. Like I, I love that stuff. And I'm trying to incorporate in ways that are metal and don't look anything yeah. like it. But there's so many lessons in that stuff. Yeah. And it's kind of touching on the previous point that we talked about about like, you know, not just looking at artists within the metal industry, you know, yeah. finding things outside of, you know, the to kind of incorporate into your own voice. Yeah. Well, cool, man. Um, let's pull up some of your work and talk through it. Sure. And, uh, you know, when I, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you, you praise and stuff, you know, I, <laughs> I'm not trying to give you a giant ego boost, but you know, when I see something I like, I'm going to say it it's like okay. this painting for this, this for me is, I think one of my favorites you've done. And a lot of it's just oh, cool. kind of because I see that sergeant reference, but then like the the like limited color scheme, uh, the way you did the whole gatefold is just brilliant. And then like the cover, you have the strong figure, but then the back supports it. Like I just I love this painting and this record. This record rules. If you guys oh, haven't yeah. checked it out, but I'll let you speak to it before I boost you up too much. <laughs> yeah, actually, I think I have the record here. Um, it's uh, fires in the distance. I'm sorry. I... Yeah, fires in the distance. Yeah, God, um, great band. Yeah, they're they're a bunch of great guys too. I got to see them um, a couple of years, no, two years ago. Well, two years ago now, they came out to Cleveland. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, got the record. Um, I don't think I did the design of this. I think it was released through Prosthetic. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, uh, I also did their logo. So I did their the logo and their sigil and. 
And we came up with, I came up with this like sort of border design for it. Can you show that logo real quick? Yeah. I don't know if it's good. No, my camera's not going to. I can at least see this shape. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, it's a, yeah, they're really good. They're like, um, like doom sort of like metal. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, a bunch of great guys. Um, they, I did their previous cover too. Um, the, the whole idea behind these covers was that we're going to do each like season. So this oh. is the winter one. Um, the previous one, it was like fall. And, you know, the next ones are going to be spring and, and summer. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, really, I'm also a big fan of the band. You know, their sound is super cool. And it's been great seeing the blow up. Is uh, they've been around for like a couple years before this. So this is a bit of a breakthrough for them, though. Yeah, and they they weren't even supposed to be like a a, a like a live like you know they were yeah. supposed to release like a couple albums and that was it. But, Dude, I also love how you captured the distance of those trees so well. Like, was that one of the harder parts of the painting is to get that illusion of distance, or um, would it just be? Is it it you know, just once you kind of map out the shapes and the values, it just kind of figured itself out. Yeah, I, this was actually one of those paintings before I sort of developed my like more technical, like having a very technical um, drawing and then underpainting. So um, this was kind of very loosely blocked in overall. And then, yeah, and then I, I mean, the whole like receding distance. Um, was something I actually learned from photo manipulation um, using like sort of a, you know, a fog like brush or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so like I use a big soft brush for the background and kind of blocked in the trees and then big soft brush and then light between the trees. Um, I think the hardest part actually was uh, the, I originally just painted the front of this cover and the band came back and wanted uh, back as well. Uh, so I had to tie it. Yeah. So I had to then figure out how <laughs> rest of the paint was going to look with just what I put on the front. So I think about right in the middle where that branch is coming off onto the um, right side mm -hmm. is where the cover stops. Yeah. So like, so like right here is where it, right here is where it stops. Um, here, one uh, second. I'm a little delayed. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess. Yeah, right here is where it stopped, and then I had to basically extrapolate an entire tree off of that, and then like everything else. So, what's the spine look like on that? Um, it's just is like it, I think it was just well, I don't think it's but but it was basically just uh, the extension of it. I think oh, yeah. it? they just put a black, like black sort of spine. I imagine the folds in the drapery uh, or of her dress were also challenging. That kind of stuff could be tricky. Yeah, I mean, I actually referenced directly from a uh, uh, John Sear Sargent painting of uh, I think it's like these two women fishing or something. And then I, you know, did obviously change the anatomy and the, all that, but but I referenced the dress, so I was trying to get that like very loose style that that's yeah. Sargent has. But, but yeah, um, it was difficult because like. He has, you know, one stroke. And <laughs> for me, I had to like do like twenty <laughs> strokes or it was like like anything near. So, <laughs> but yeah, man, oh, that's cool. So you you still feeling pretty good on this one, or do you see see all the like little mistakes? You know, how do you feel about it? Oh, I see a lot of mistakes. <laughs> uh, personally, there's like, for example, the uh, uh, the lighting on the side of her dress should. Have been blended into the rock behind it based off the lighting and like the way that I angled the hand and just I mean as an artist you know you, you you're constantly critical of things but but uh but I mean I think overall I think it was a successful painting I mean I really liked how the colors came out yeah um, yeah no that's an excellent one man uh what's next all right cool so two covers for Acacia Strain which yeah you know that's that's a, a big band and uh love seeing them live and big part of my high school as well, man. And I still yeah. listen to them, but like, especially like continent and um, wormwood. I mean, I've listened to those things all the time. Still do yeah. when I go to the gym and stuff, you know, wormwood is so good. Like, yeah. 
But yeah, what about how did how did uh, this all come to fruition, man? Like, who did you work with on that side, and you got any story to go with it? Yeah, so so I did I did Slow Decay um, and uh, their last album, so with the uh, the whole extended landscape, um, and then so Vincent brought me back for this one. Um, we we actually we became uh, pretty good friends um, after working together. Um, and so the whole idea with this, I remember we they were doing the slow decay, and then it comes in waves, uh, split, um, like shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I think it was, it was two or three years ago now, two years ago. Um, so and they came to Cleveland, and uh, I was hanging out with Vincent in the basement. He was like, "Yeah, so I have like a you know a big idea for an album. You know, we're going to do two albums. One of them is going to be you know." And then I kind of want both of them to like sort of connect together. And so we we balanced ideas back for a couple months after that. And then I think, I forgot, I think I came up with this idea, but I was like, um, where we wanted, so the Step Into the Light, which is the white cover, um, was supposed to be sort of like this very, not exactly like happy cover, but it was supposed to be like, kind of like, like, um, you know, not very dismal, sort of like kind of subtly, you know, like just a nature scene, you know? Yeah. So, but then like, as you, because the whole idea I had was there's this one, um, Nick Clennon, uh, story where it's called, I think the white people, something, but basically in the story, there are these two, um, people having this sort of philosophical conversation about horror. And one of them says that true horror is some ordinary thing in your life, like say your dog or something, doing something that is completely extraordinary or something that is not what it normally do. So like you, your dog talking to you or something would be true horror, you know, you experience hmm. true horror from, from something like that, you know, not like some crazy monster or something. It'd be just ordinary things, you know, doing things that they're not supposed to. So that was the, the whole idea for the, you know, the step of the light cover was that there was going to be this Robin basically feeding the big birds like meat from like a, a corpse, which, you know, they're, they're, they're not carnivorous creatures. And um, so that was supposed to be the whole idea behind that one. And then, and then on the other one, you'd see where it got the, the meat from. Yeah. yeah. And you got the maggots to go along with it. Yeah. Kind of further that point. Yeah. Yeah, because the maggots were supposed to be this whole representation of like, you know, the it's supposed to be the world, you know, our world is, you know, how we just the previous generation destroyed it. And so that's what's supposed to be is the, the you know, mother robin feeding this essentially rancid meat to its young as the, the rancid, you know, the maggots basically consume the young in itself. So it was like a whole matter of four for the planet being handed to us from the next generation. And how it's basically been rotten, and they've you know taken all the resources, and now these you know the next generation has to sort of survive in this rotten you know maggoty world or whatever. Um, so yeah, so it was a lot of like levels upon levels. I don't think it was entirely clear all those ideas as as clear as the you know slow decay was, which was very sort of simple you know landscape decaying you know idea. But but I really enjoyed working on this. It was uh, Vincent's always has awesome ideas. Um, he's always very like hands off you know you do your thing so yeah i mean i see i see the 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 theme and like everything you said i don't think it's too abstract i think you hit the nail on the head i i like these covers and it also furthers that point of like sometimes the things that are the most like metal and and heavy kind of like they come from different places and it injects a new kind of like like if you had a, a whole list of the death metal or metal covers from the year, these would be different than those. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So really cool. So then we got the crown magnetar cover on the left here. And then on the right, this is just a painting I pulled off your Instagram that I liked. I think I liked the dragon, you know, (laughs) it was this personal piece or did you, was this for a band? Uh, Yeah, that was for this um, like sort of, Black metal folk, more mostly black metal band called Duero, Duero Delph. Okay, and it's inspired by Elden Ring. So, oh, nice. 
Yeah. Well, let's talk about the the crown magnetar. Um, how did this one come together, and what are some things that you, you know, you still like about it, or how do you feel on it? Yeah, um, this was a sort of continuation off of the previous two covers I did for them. So um, I did their first cover, and then I did Alone and Death. And the whole idea behind both of them was that we were they're kind of like portraits of demons, in a sense. Um, so this one is obviously it's, you know a uh, reference to the you know Christ on the cross, um, but basically the idea was Van went to portray like eternal suffering or pain, and in you know Christian sort of belief, you know that's kind of what the you know crucif crucifixion of Christ was. You know was the was this eternal pain and suffering. So. Um, that's that was kind of the idea of this. Then you know, obviously, taking it to the next level with you know having the nails all over the the body and you know completely wrapped thorns and and stuff. And, and I really enjoyed this one. Um, the guys at Crown Magnetar are an absolute pleasure to know and, and work with. Um, they're uh, they're really really great guys. Um, and uh, you know, I, we had kind of a vague idea of like a guy on a throne. And then I wanted to incorporate the uh, the Crown Magnetar sigil into the throne. So that's what you kind of see in the background. Nice. Um, yeah. And this was actually kind of a very, um, another turning point painting for me. Cause it was like, you know, I wanted to kind of do something that I really thought was cool and, and a little more over the top, um, than my usual, like sort of neoclassical sort of a little more subtle paintings. So, so this was kind of a point where I was like, you know, I can kind of incorporate more metal aspects into the, to my work and, and make it still my own um but yeah that's that's what this one was about um you can you know the the box lesson you can see here too man you could fit that guy into a box perfectly you got the <laughs> the 3d form on him and the throne so well done you know thank you yeah i think i actually used a, a 3d software to kind of pose the figure to kind of get a general idea of how it look to reference while working so but yeah this was definitely a having that 3d uh or the having the box draw box thing was was a very very helpful for this very cool man. i love the colors too like those grays and like subtle little bit of blue in there and i don't know, i just love how complex that uh the sky is when you really think about like what color you're looking at you know it's not just black but there's there's a lot to it you know it's 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 a very built out color. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of uh, one of my more favorite ones. I also got to do the entire album layout for it. It was one of my, uh, another unique leader release that I got to like sort of do the full package. Huh? Yeah. I got to do everything. I got to do the merch designs. I got to do the artwork. Um, this was a lot of fun to design too. I had the whole idea of like doing this, you know, kind of thorns motif with this splattered blood. Oh, like, nice. Texture. So, and then you know I could do so. And then I drew a sigil for them as well. It was kind of a three um, D version of their the current one or the flattened one that I made for them. So, so yeah, this was a this is a really fun project. It was it was like something that I would do as like personal project if like you know it was for a band. So yeah, that must be cool to like be able to do the entire package. Like I don't, you know, there's not many artists that I've talked with that have done the entire thing very cool yeah yeah it's it's nice to have kind of full creative control and expression in, in, in throughout it um not that i don't you know enjoy working with other artists work and stuff but you know it's kind of nice to be able to be like yeah that's like my my thing you know 100 percent well, we talked a little bit about this one. Anything you want to add on kind of the final result of this piece? Yeah, I mean, um, this was another fun one to work with, work on. Um, I worked with Wyatt uh, from Last Seconds of Life. Uh, the whole idea behind it was they had like an EP that was released, I think it was Disposition of an Execution, where there's like this figure getting just like stomped on it. And I guess the whole idea was that this was like purgatory where the figure from that release was sent. Um, and yeah, it was, it was cool because the last 10 seconds of life has been around for a while. They're, they're 
kind of local to me. Um, and uh, they haven't really, a lot of their album covers have been sort of like more hardcore, like inspired. Mm-hmm. A lot of you know, like pictures and um, like sort of symbols and stuff. But this was, you know, so it was cool to be able to do something different for them um, in my own style with, you know, like little demons and, and uh, all that. But yeah. It was, a, it was a fun project to work on. I like the all the motion and the composition going like kind of at that diagonal. It it adds to the intensity of it, you know. If everything was just kind of like on a more flat like horizon line, I feel like it wouldn't have as much like impact and feeling to it. So it's a good decision. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So some sigils and logos, man. Um, I guess kind of pick pick which ones you want to talk through and um, maybe what that process is like in terms of working with the band. Like, are they, do you find that bands are more finicky and picky when it comes to logos and sigils because it's such like a quick statement, you know? And, and I also feel like, I don't know, it's just kind of like, yes, that's what we want or no, that's not what we want, you know? Whereas maybe with the painting, it's like, just little details here and there that maybe people want some changes on. Maybe I'm projecting, but do you, how is it working with bands in this capacity? No, I mean, you're right. Actually, um, like just like logos and sigils and stuff are, that's what's going to represent your band across, you know, merch and you know, everything. So, you know, sometimes you'll have bands be a little more particular about that. But um, I mean, I've also, another thing is I've been trying to develop my own style for that. So, you know, when you come to me, you're, you're coming from my, you know, style. A lot of people come for me for the Lorna Shore style logo. Um, yeah. Which I'm like, you know, that's, I did it once. Like, it's not the trials <laughs> we do. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, with sigils, it's a little bit different because it's more abstract. You know, it's more representational uh, with, you know, the typography, you know, it's, some bands can be a little more particular. Um, most of the bands I work with are pretty cool about me just doing my thing. Um, though I did recently have a pretty crappy experience with a band who's just, you know, very, not exactly particular, but just not very um, understanding or whatever with, uh, but anyways, it was for a logo. But um, but yeah, um, I mean, my process, like for the Lorna Shore logo, I actually, that was a collaboration with Christoph from uh, Lord of the Logos. Yeah, uh, you know, so it's done Emperor and all these other things. A collaboration, huh? Yeah, so it's a collaboration. So the um, band brought me and Christoph on. Christoph drew the initial um, shape of the logo based off of a previous logo I designed for the band, um, and then I went in and did all the detailing and sort of uh, adjustments to it. So it was, it was very, it was really great process. Christoph was really cool um, and a legend. You know, he's a legendary logo designer very prolific too so so it was, it was great getting to work with him and um also to see how iconic that logo has become you know yeah it's huge yeah um yeah actually a lot of these are for Lorna Shore the uh, uh that was for the and I Return to Nothingness um release for them and then the Pain Remains uh stage sigils so those are each the one on the lower um, right hand corner so those are all like sigils inspired by uh, so it's, it's basically like I take the, the names of each of the members and then I like break it up into um, so it's like word sigils. So and then I draw in. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah, that has kind of an occult like feel. The the one in the bottom right there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what it was um, inspired by. Um, yeah, and then they use those for uh, their stage gear. So they got printed like big on like these custom uh, jackets and stuff. Um, yeah, and then the cattle decapitation. Uh, I think that one was for Death Atlas. Um, that was my first release. I worked with uh, with Travis and Cattle Decap, and uh, that one was really cool. They made them into big, like metal sort of signs that they put um, for each of their shows. Oh wow! Yeah, getting to see like a uh, getting to see it used like that. So I got a pair of sweatpants that have that sigil on them. Yeah, yeah, they use it all over the branding. I got, I got a special edition like Death Atlas box set where they use it on the like the front and like the like special vinyl disc and 
yeah, so it was, it was really cool. Do you have a favorite cattle decap album? Um, I really like the last two. Terra said that that was really good. Um, the Anthropocene era was like the album that got me into cattle decap. Mm-hmm. So, so that one's also a favorite. But um, funny story is uh, when I was like in high school, before I got into like really heavier stuff like that, my friend who was very much the cattle decap um, was like, hey man, let me, let me I think it was a uh, Miss gender reappropriation. I forgot. What oh, was. that video. Yeah. yeah he's like, See how long, how much of this video can sit through. And I think I sat through like 30 seconds. We don't <laughs> to, uh, turn it off. <laughs> and then here, here I am like all these years later working with them. So that yeah, cool. is funny. Yeah. And I got uh, these two pieces here. Um, can I, I knew, but then I, I took the images without the logo, so that isn't doing me any favors here. What were the the band the one on the left? What was the band for that? Uh, Distant. Okay. Crowd Mag guitars a little. Yeah. Got it. Okay, that makes sense too with the the further you know, kind of like the religious themes with the Crowd Magnetar on the right there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was like the Crowd Magnetar one was like sort of blasphemous take on the uh, Mary uh, Mother Mary. Mm-hmm. So, so instead of like you know Jesus in her lap, it's like a sacrificial lamb. Um, then she's like all you know demonic and all that jazz. But that one was uh, actually became blew up on Instagram, um, reached over oh, really? like a million people or something, and like thirty thousand likes. So that kind of really helped boost my my page on that platform. So very uh, nice. Yeah, um, it's was that of- was that when the, the algorithm was a little more friendly too? Like when yeah, did it come out? It was like the mysterious, like it hit the explore page, which I, you know, to have no idea. No one knows how you get on the explore page, but I guess that's how you get big on Instagram instead. But so I guess it went on the explore page, and yeah, probably a lot of people to my work. But um, and then the distant one was uh, was the first one I worked with um, Alan, um, who ended up actually working with me at Uni Clear as well. But um, oh, cool. Yeah, but that was the first uh, set of three. Uh, Albums. The next one after that was like this big um, demonic, like figure that Alan had. This whole really cool like storyline that was inspired by like Dark Souls and Mortal Shell and stuff. Um, and then, uh, and then they kind of use that as their mascot, is that the figure with the spikes and all that. So um, I, I after the um, Tyra Latofia series, which was those three albums, they started to work with different artists because they kind of shifted their sound. Away from the blackened sort of um, style, but, um, but yeah, um, I, I still work with Alan. Uh, he's a good friend. Um, yeah, that that one uh, was a was a really fun commission to work on um, and story to kind of flesh like flesh out the story. So. Yeah, no, they're they're really cool pieces. But the crowd magnetar one on the right, I especially like how Mary is like just a little offset from that center and then that little peeking through sun and the way the color shifts like that, that red to blue, uh, gradation is just so cool. Thanks. Yeah. It was supposed to be a kind of connection to the last one where I had a similar sort of like sunset, like type thing going on. Um, yeah, that was a lot of fun to work on. All right, cool. So, this is more of those illustrations you were talking about that you're um, starting to kind of do more of. Yeah. Yeah. So these are the ones for the Acacia string. Um, so we, we've been doing a series of like uh, souls born inspired um, illustrations for merch designs. So you got uh Yorm, and then Placidus sucks. And, um, uh, all the you know bosses from the uh the i don't know anything about it so <laughs> <laughs> i'm just like I'm oh not. these are cool monsters you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, i'm a big souls fan uh, the, the aesthetics very much fit in our work in, in sort of style so but uh but yeah I, I work with vincent with he's also a huge um dark souls fan and, and all that so we always talk about like the new games and we're both very excited for the new Elden ring dlc uh that's coming out but so there'll probably be another one <laughs> another merch design from that but, uh, but yeah, so this is kind of a new, this is, I mean, a style that I've always kind of done, um, but recently I've been really sort of digging in and learning more about and more 
how it, how to do it properly. Um, yeah. It's a whole different skill set than painting, you know? It is. I actually, at first, I kind of really hated it. Um, all the lines and stuff felt really tedious. But mm -hmm. now that I've been doing it more, it's, it's actually kind of gotten into the flow and it's a lot more relaxing. And now that I kind of understand how to, how to shade things and, and make things work. You know? it's, it's funny because I, I've been in pen and ink world for like the last year. So now I'm like doing more painting and I'm like, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole different thing. You know, you got to think about things a little bit differently. Yeah. It's a lot more permanent too. Like the painting, you can kind of push around, you know, the paint and stuff. Whereas... Well, I do, I do watercolor. So it's, okay. yeah, it's actually probably uh, less forgiving than a uh, pen and ink. Cause I can use like some white out stuff just a little bit. Yeah. And like that helps me out with some little blemishes, but God, watercolor, man, I love it, but it's, it's pretty unforgiving. Yeah. <laughs> I can't even imagine. Yeah. <laughs> like it, it looks really cool. When it's done though. So. Yeah. Well, I guess my masochist, you know, so our all artists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So we got Surruption on the left and I'm blanking on the one on the right. Do you remember what band that was for? Yeah. It was for the, this band called Gore. Gore. Okay, cool. The Surruption cover. I think I didn't know that was you actually when I first saw it, but that's a pretty, pretty good technical death metal album i remember listening to it i, I was digging it but yeah. uh yeah what's what's your take on these two yeah so i actually did um disruptions previous album cover monument um of, of the end uh which was actually one of my first bigger bands and labels to work with got released in Sumerian records um so then they, they actually returned to unique leader which is really cool and uh, so I did this one, Jord, for them. Um, and um, yeah, it was, uh, I had kind of been shifting away from the whole sci-fi sort of like style. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of the whole aesthetic. Um, so I kind of, it was, I did a mix of, um, of like Albert Dorr and uh, his like landscape paintings and then this whole sci-fi like object in the background. The whole idea was this like big machine was like transforming land because Jord uh, means soil in their native tongue. Um, so, so yeah, so actually, I really liked working on this. Um, it was a, a nice sort of change of pace, and it was kind of a nice throwback to my, like, original style of work, which was a lot of, like, big mechanisms and these, like, sort of, like, desolate landscapes was something I was very into when I first started. Um, yeah, and uh, actually, this was before I started using like painterly brushes i was practicing a lot with uh, using the round brush to kind of develop my skills of blending and um creating texture with something that's you know just a basic brush so um so this was a lot of it was uh, the round brush with like a little bit of um texture brush and uh, it was a lot of a lot of tedious detailing a lot of figuring out how how to make something look textured with, with a very simple brush but, um, right, but you can do a lot more with less with the the brushes you're using now because it'll kind of create some of that stuff and almost an accidental look. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot more, yeah, like a lot more artifacts that are left in the mm, the brush yes. stroke. Yeah. Um, and then the gore one was uh, that was a fun one. Um, originally, the idea was like a a gateway to hell, um, and then uh, I kind of just rolled with the whole idea and was it was initially just going to be this big cathedral that was in this like kind of like ruinous hellish landscape and then it kind of felt a little too empty so i decided to have this giant demon hand coming out of it which was yeah. i was inspired by um i can never pronounce his name but it's like it's a big new uh Bilak. <laughs> oh Polish. yeah yeah Polish artist he did the a ghost imperial triumphant yeah he did the recent like dark throne goat lord um artwork there's like the big hand the it's hand like, yeah yeah that thing's I, so I, sick i was like very inspired by that so i was like I'll, to put you know some hand in this, this painting like that so it's funny i was just looking at that earlier today because i'm working on a piece right now that's not gonna look anything like that but some of the color choices he used i'm gonna use as like a color reference yeah he's an incredible he's a architect too like yeah um, which is why he's like such technical Drawings, it's insane. 
the, his use of like three point perspective is also crazy. Yeah, that Imperial Triumphant Alphaville cover is insane, dude. Yeah. yeah. All right, I think, yep, yeah, there's the last slide. Um, personal work on the left, Lorna Shore album on the right, correct? Yep. Really like that painting on the left. That thing spoke to me when I came across it. That's why I wanted to include it here. Thank you. Yeah, that's. Um, I really enjoyed working on it. It was. Uh, I painted it during a period of. So it was born out of like a period of time where I was feeling very disillusioned with my work. Um, I had this major band I worked with. Uh, basically, take one of my the covers that I did for them, and then have another artist basically run it through an AI generator, and then use the basically butchered version of my work um, for for their covers. Like a legit AI generator? Yeah, like the artist, whoever, they, they commissioned some other artist who was like designer or something and he ran the, the artwork that I did through the AI generative software and basically created like some ash version of it, of what I created. Jeez. And so that was a big like kick in the balls. And so I was like, well, okay. Um, so so was, this painting was a, a series that I'm working on called The Sundering of the Gods, um, where it's basically just a bunch of personal paintings that, um, have very sort of real ritualistic elements to it, very like occult heavy. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it like was sort of a mix between like Viking funerals and sort of the like Egyptian sort of mummification. Mm -hmm. um, so you have you know, the figure in the boat, and, uh, and I was also very inspired by um, Peter Paul Rubens. Um, I believe he's the one who did it, but. Um, this one painting of uh from I think it's from Macbeth. Uh it's called the Lady's Shallot or whatever. And it's like this woman in a boat and she's basically being cast off and I think she she commits suicide. Um and I have it as my background on my computer. And uh so I was very inspired by that as well. Um yeah, that was a very personal piece to me. It had a lot to do about like sort of letting go and, and, and death and you know. Kind of making your your voice in the in in this world with uh, with your work and your art and stuff. So. I love it. I, there's like little things that I mean the big picture. I I love, but I love the uh, the shine that you have on that. I mean, it's kind of like a medallion around her behind her head kind of thing. But like the it looks so realistic how you rendered that, and then your color choices in the distance there. And the fact that you have so much distance and depth instead of cutting it shorter, like I just love that too. So Thank it's you. a real it's a really, really nice painting. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, the sort of shield medallion thing was actually a bit of like an accident. Um it's kind of just messing around with values and it happened to come out like that. I was like, sick. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right. And uh the Lorna Shore album on the right. This is the first one with uh, Will Ramos on, right? No, that was or just the one after, wasn't it? Yeah, the one after. <clears throat> that was on CJ, which thank you, CJ, because he totally ruined, <laughs> ruined that album <laughs> for me a little bit because of all. Oh the, yeah, because of the uh, yeah, it was like right around when the launch was. So yeah, yeah. So, I was bringing up that, but yeah, it kind of the whole thing it was. Uh, Kind of made it so I didn't end up doing their next album cover because they kind of want to separate themselves from it. So he kind of fucked that for me. But um, but yeah, um, that that one's probably one of my more well known covers is the Immortal cover. Um, and uh, it was back when I was doing the photo, the matte painting style. So it was like a lot of you know, so the a lot of digital um, texturing there, photos. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean it. You know, it became really iconic in its own way. Um, it was the first album cover where it was like a realistic sort of like painting type work for them, where previously they'd always had like just a basic symbol or sigil on the covers. Um, and uh, it, it sort of, this also really set me on the map for being an artist in the scene, um, you know, and uh, it actually also it led to the uh, the Acacia Strain um, commissions for Slow K because they saw this one. They're like, "Oh, that's exactly what we want for 
for our next um, release and kind of brought me a lot of opportunities, which was awesome. So, so yeah, so I, I really uh, appreciate I think I, I have it here framed. Um, <laughs> The whole thing frame. Oh, nice. Yeah. So yeah. So so this was a was a pretty big milestone project. Was for that me. was that uh 2019? What year was that? Yeah, 2019. Yeah, yeah. five years ago. <laughs> I know, man. Well, that's really cool, dude. And it's it's been neat to see your evolution from there as well. So it's always nice to have those albums. You know, when I'm, I'm talking with folks that that kind of got the word out and more work. Um, as you start to kind of wrap up here, I'm looking at, you know, I write out some questions ahead of time. I think the, the main thing I was thinking was I asked this to all the, the guests, but if you had one or a couple pieces of advice for somebody who wants to improve their art and maybe contribute to working with bands, um, what do you got for them? Um, I think, especially in uh, the current like era, like era that we're in, where you know the AI generative art and it's a very like fast paced social media environment. I think it's very important for any upcoming artist to kind of you know take your time and find your style. You know, really practice your craft. Um, you know, uh, really figure out if this is even something you want to do. You know, because like. Being a freelance artist, um, you really have to love, you know, this this work and, and your work and working with bands because because it, it gets you know it's not all super glamorous, you know. Um, you're you're in the background a lot of the time, you know. You're kind of the like your work will be shown, you know, to all these people, but most people probably won't even know who you are, um, which is fine, you know. I mean, like first, you know, it's kind of always been a benefit, but um, but yeah, I mean, just you know, really figure out what you want to say and how you want to say it and you know don't don't jump in too quickly and um and uh you know um and have fun with it you know have fun like doing this work because a lot you know if you make this into a career there's going to be a lot of times where it's not fun at all you know sometimes you're going to be like well i kind of wish it was still just a hobby but but yeah (laughs) yeah i can imagine man well Kaylin, I appreciate you spending time on the show. Uh, I think a lot of people are going to glean some insights from it. It's good to get to know you. Uh, For everybody watching, please check out his work on his Instagram. Support the albums that Unique Leader puts out, as well as the ones that he uh, contributes art to. And just be on the lookout for all the new stuff that's coming uh, from him in the future. Anything else on your end, dude? No, I think that... uh... This is great talking to you, man. I really appreciate you having me on, on this. And, uh, you know, it's a great, great conversation. Yeah, likewise. We'll stay behind for a minute. Everybody, see you guys later, probably next Thursday. Bye. Just realized it went full screen. And there we go.